Buenas tardes, everyone. My name is Carlos Menchaca. I'm the chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. Before beginning, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the committee. They're not here yet, uh, but I will make sure that I give um, shout outs to them. We are joined by many folks in the audience right now who are advocates, who are people impacted by uh, the conversation that we're gonna be having today. Uh, we will be examining the city's support and services for recipients of temporary protected status, or TPS. This hearing comes at a very important and critical time, not just for the city, but for our nation. Between the fall of 2017 and the summer of 2018, President Trump directed the Department of Homeland Security to end TPS designations for six countries. While this D designation is part of the federal's federal administration's attack on immigrant communities, this specific action is unprecedented. It threatens to deport nearly 500,000 recipients to face potentially dangerous conditions from which they were initially granted the protection. Temporary protected status, TPS, exists for one reason. It is a temporary immigration status that is granted to eligible nations of TPS designated countries residing in the United States. It is based on an, on an in-country conditions that the Department of Homeland Security has deemed to be unlivable. Conditions like environmental disasters, ongoing armed conflict, and other extraordinary and temporary conditions that prevent safe return. The U.S. currently provides TPS to approximately 437,000 foreign nationals from 10 different countries, El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, Nepal, uh, Nicaragua, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. But President Trump is committed to expelling TPS recipients and has set forth the following termination, termination dates for six of the 10 countries, Sudan on November to uh, November 2nd, 2018, Haiti on January 5th, 2020, Nicaragua on January 5th, 2019, El Salvador on September 9th, 2019, Nepal on June 24th, 2019, and Honduras on July 22nd, 2019. This de-designation will impact 428, 258,000 TPS recipients, or approximately 98% of the current TPS beneficiaries. Thankfully, we have advocates across the nation, including here in New York City, who are doing everything within their power to challenge the federal government's arbitrary terminations of TPS. Various lawsuits have been filed, the basis of which range from racial discrimination, violations of the Immigration and Nationality Act and Administrative Procedures Act, an infringement on the constitutional rights of TPS beneficiaries. On October 3rd, 2018, a U.S. District Judge in Northern District of California issued a preliminary injunction halting the end of TPS designation for Sudan, Haiti, El Salvador, Nicaragua, until a final ruling on the merits is issued. As a result, TPS recipients are currently in limbo. While they are safe pending this final ruling, they face the terrifying uncertainty that their lives will be uprooted, fearing a tomorrow where some will have to return to potentially dangerous passport countries, leaving their families and homes behind. If you've seen the news lately, circumstances haven't suddenly become livable in Syria or Yemen or Sudan or South Sudan and Honduras, El Salvador or Haiti. It would not only be harmful to TPS recipients to deport them to dangerous conditions, in their passport countries, but it would also hurt communities across the United States, including here in our own city of New York. TPS recipients are deeply integrated into our communities, providing emotional and financial support to their children and loved ones, and playing vital roles in our communities, our schools, and our businesses. TPS recipients also play an important role in our nation's economy with a labor force participation rate of 88.5%. Ending TPS would have significant and far-reaching impacts on a larger community, socially, emotionally, and financially. Here in New York City, there are 15,000 TPS recipients, 15,000 New Yorkers. Many of our TPS recipients have lived in the city an average of 15 years. These aren't strangers. They are our colleagues, 
our neighbors, our parents, our children. There, and there are 8,000 U.S. born children in the, li- in, in the city living in families with at least one TPS recipient. I'm gonna read that again. There are 8,000 U.S. born children, U.S. born children in the city living in families with at least one TPS recipient. Terminating TPS could mean negatively impacting the economic stability of these families by removing a breadwinner. And the breadwinner's work authorization and ultimately separating the parents from the children, yet once again, we're separating children from their families. The New York City Council is committed to ensuring we protect our immigrant communities and families. And I will not stand idly by as the federal administration targets our families Today, we will hear from members of the public advocates and the mayoral administration. We hope to hear what is being done to ensure that all TPS recipients are being connected and supported by legal screenings so that they are prepared for the worst, even as we hope for the best. Thank you to the staff uh, who have prepared for this hearing today, the whole staff of the Committee on Immigration, my committee counsel, Harbani Auja. Committee Policy Analyst Elizabeth Kronk, Finance Analyst Jin Lee, and my staff, chief, my Chief of Staff, Societa Meng, and Communications Director, uh, Tony uh, Chirito. Uh, thank you uh, for Queens member Bob Holden, who is here with us today. Uh, and with that, I want to call the administration up. Our Commissioner, Abita Mustafi, and anyone else on, on your team? Okay. We're going to swear you in. Thank you so much. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank Thank you. you. So bear with me. I have a bit of a cold, as you know, but I will do my best. (coughs) Okay. Thank you to Chair Menchaca and members of the Committee on Immigration. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Thank you very much for calling a hearing on this critical issue. We really appreciate the opportunity to discuss this crisis affecting thousands of New Yorkers. Our agency works to remain consistently up to date and rapidly sh- in the rapidly shifting landscape of temporary protected status designations and how it affects our communities. We are committed to doing everything we can as a city to protect our communities, to inform the public, and ensure that if TPS recipients lose their status, they can still access services and benefits to the greatest extent possible. Thus, our work takes an approach of providing legal services, community outreach and education, rapid response and research and analysis, as well as advocacy at the city, state, and federal levels. While this issue has received less national attention than the many other crises caused by the federal administration, the termination of TPS designations for six countries is particularly cruel. TPS recipients who will be affected by these decisions are mostly long-term residents of the United States, have US citizen family members, and have no serious criminal convictions. The terminations will leave thousands of individuals undocumented, placing them at risk of deportation to countries that even federal officials have admitted remain unstable and unsafe for return. Moreover, the circumstances and rhetoric surrounding these termination decisions have revealed these TPS determinations were motivated by anti-black and anti-Latinx racism. In today's testimony, I will provide the committee with an overview of TPS, the current legal and political landscape surrounding recent TPS terminations, an overview of how these terminations directly impact New Yorkers, and a detailed overview of our city's efforts to continue to serve and empower our communities. In 1990, Congress created, with bipartisan support, the Temporary Protected Status Program. The TPS program provides work authorization and relief from deportation for immigrants in the United States who cannot return to their home countries due to ongoing turmoil, such as armed conflict, natural disasters, or other extraordinary circumstances. To obtain TPS, individuals must meet certain eligibility requirements, including a lack of serious criminal convictions. TPS does not provide a pathway to citizenship, although some recipients may adjust their status through U.S. citizen family members or other avenues. 
Its quote unquote temporary nature means that the Department of Homeland Security reviews TPS designations every six to 18 months based upon a review of country conditions. Recipients must re-register for TPS each time DHS extends their country's designation. They must maintain their eligibility and pay up to $495 in application fees. In a break from the last 20 years of previous practice, the Trump administration has decided to terminate TPS for six out of the nine countries it had the opportunity to review. Past federal administrations of both political parties have always taken into account current country conditions when evaluating whether an extension of TPS is warranted. However, the Trump administration has broken with long-standing policy and instead only considered the original condition or event that determined that initial designation. Litigation has challenged these terminations and remains ongoing. These cases have produced evidence that these terminations were made without the weight of evidence and against the recommendations of career federal officials. Moreover, the decisions accord with the president's racist and xenophobic rhetoric. It is not a coincidence that the majority of the individuals affected by these terminations are black and brown people. Indeed, the president has made his motivations clear in referring to predominantly black TPS designated countries in vulgar and demeaning terms that I will not repeat. These terminations are particularly cruel in that most of the people with TPS are long-term residents, many of whom have US citizen family members. The decision to cast away members of our community is rooted in anti-black and anti-Latinx racism, which has been evident by, as I said, the president's own words. The administration's actions to terminate TPS designations create economic harm as recipients lose their work authorization and many of whom are the primary breadwinners of their families. And they have also already had a negative public health impact with TPS recipients experiencing toxic levels of stress and anxiety. Five federal lawsuits have been filed in response to these terminations. In October of last year, the Federal District Court of, the Nor of Northern California issued a nationwide preliminary injunction stopping DHS from terminating, terminating TPS for Haiti, Sudan, Nicaragua, and El Salvador. Notably, Honduran and Nepali TPS recipients were not a part of this in litigation or the decision because the case was filed before TPS for those countries had been terminated. Major decisions in the other four cases remain pending. Central to all of these cases is challenging these terminations is the issue of racial animus. While uncertainty persists due to ongoing litigation, TPS recipients from six, six countries stand to lose their legal status by 2020. Those six countries are Sudan, Nicaragua, Nepal, Haiti, El Salvador, and Honduras. Nationally, this totals to nearly 400,000 people. Last year, Moya released a fact sheet on TPS recipients in New York City to provide local stakeholders and advocates with information about this population. We estimate that approximately 15,000 New Yorkers are TPS recipients, and over 8,000 US born children live in households with a TPS recipient. Additionally, TPS recipients tend to be long term US residents. They have lived here an average of 15 years. The vast majority of TPS holders in New York City are from Haiti, El Salvador, and Honduras. The Trump administration has terminated TPS for all of these countries. We also found that TPS recipients are important contributors to our city economy. They account for approximately 260 million in income in New York City each year. In 2017, TPS recipients generated an estimated $591.1 million in gross city product. Additionally, TPS recipients have a higher labor force participation rate than the general population, and many work in the education and health service industries. In addition to TPS recipients from the six countries the Trump administration has declined to extend, a number of Liberians in New York City protected by a similar program will also lose legal status. On March 23rd of this year, all Liberians who, had, who have benefited from deferred and forced departure will lose their protection from deportation. The size of this population is not large nationwide. As of 2017, at least 745 Liberians are covered 
but we know that in Staten Island, it is among the top areas of residence for librarians in the United States. Among the most important ways in which we've responded to the Trump administration attacks on TPS has been outreach and public education. Beginning in 2017, Moya has led a robust effort to provide information to residents, including regular conversations with community-based organizations, labor unions, faith leaders, and elected officials. We've conducted multiple briefing calls with elected officials and counselors on our fact sheet, and we've organized 15 TPS-focused outreach days of action, along with many TPS-specific Know Your Rights forums with the help of 144 volunteers. Through our outreach efforts, we've reached an estimated 50,000 constituents across the city. Additionally, we keep the public apprised of the latest news and developments on TPS with a specific page on our website designated for this subject at nyc.gov forward slash TPS. The city has also ensured that our unprecedented investments in immigration legal services can provide assistance with TPS renewals. In response to federal actions, Action NYC providers pivoted to provide urgent support to their communities affected by shifting immigration policies. For example, Action NYC sites continue to prioritize TPS re-registrations. Our Action NYC providers also provide assistance in exploring alternative avenues of immigration relief for TPS recipients at risk of losing their status. Further, NIFUP and other city immigration legal services programs provide defense against deportation, which can help those TPS recipients who need assistance in removal proceedings. The city and state have made sure that TPS recipients in New York are eligible for a range of public benefits. Benefits for which TPS recipients are eligible include Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act health insurance subsidies through the New York State of Health Marketplace, and safety net cash assistance. TPS recipients also have access to the full spectrum of services for which immigration status is not required, like IDNYC, public education, public health clinics, and more. However, because of federal eligibility limitations, there are other benefits that have eligibility requirements that exclude TPS recipients. These include SNAP, Supplemental Security Income, Public Housing, and Section 8, for example. TPS recipients who who lose their legal status due to these terminations will be rendered ineligible for a number of public benefits. Of particular concern is the loss of Medicaid coverage for low-income TPS recipients. The same concern arose in 2017 when the Trump administration attempted to rescind DACA. That decision precipitated the concern that DACA recipients would become ineligible to remain insured through Medicaid. We were very gratified at that time that the State Department of Health promulgated guidance in January of 2018 to address the concern. Following engagement by local advocacy organizations, testimony I presented in December of 2017 before a joint hearing of the Assembly Committee on Health, Puerto Rican Hispanic Task Force, and the Task Force on New Americans. In that guidance, the state clarified that DACA recipients whose DACA status is terminated will continue to be treated as eligible for Medicaid. We look forward to working with our state partners on a similar solution here to ensure that low-income TPS recipients can continue their health insurance coverage if they were to lose status. Even though the Trump administration's termination of temp TPS designations for Sudan, Nicaragua, Haiti, and El Salvador have been enjoined for now, the attempts to terminate have still posed challenges for TPS recipients. Rather than issuing new work authorization cards, the federal government announced that work authorization cards for Sudanese and Nicaraguan TPS recipients would be valid through April 2nd. If the injunction continues beyond April 2nd, the government will issue another notice. Thus, those TPS recipients only have with them expired work authorization cards. This has caused challenges in the past for immigrants seeking to renew driver's licenses or verifying their work authorizations with employers. We look forward to continuing to work alongside our state partners to find additional ways to mitigate TPS terminations, such as supporting the passage of New York State Driver's Licenses for All Bill, which could help former TPS recipients maintain their driver's licenses. Our federal advocacy on TPS has been long underway. Moya leads Cities for Action, a coalition of over 175 cities and counties across the country, 
that together advocate for pro-immigrant policy and legislation. Our advocacy for the 116th Congress will focus on TPS. We will be helping to raise the profile of this issue on the, and the crisis looming on the horizon. In particular, we will conduct extensive outreach to congressional offices, providing them with general information about the program and why legislation is so desperately needed to provide a pathway to citizenship for those who have lost TPS. And we will be highlighting why this issue is so important for cities in particular across this country. TPS recipients are vital members of our communities, contributors to our economies, and pillars of our families. We will work to ensure that Congress knows just how much it is at stake. Through Cities for Action, Mayor de Blasio and mayors across the country have sent letters to the Trump administration urging renewal for countries whose TPS extension decisions were coming up. And in November of 2017, the New York City Children's Cabinet sent a letter to DHS Acting Secretary Elaine Duke noting that 8,000 families in New York City have a U.S. citizen child living with a TPS recipient. The city also contributed to a multi-city amicus brief in the case that has resulted in the preliminary injunction against the termination of most of the TPS designations. We will continue to use every tool available to advocate for relief for TPS recipients, whether in Congress, in the federal executive branch, or in the courts. The city has been working to mitigate the damage of these terminations. We've sought to keep the public informed in real time as the legal landscape has rapidly shifted. We've gone into communities to help ensure our immigrant New Yorkers and their families can continue to feel supported by the city. We've made tremendous investments in legal services to help protect our communities from overbroad enforcement and help communities navigate an increasingly complex system. I want to thank Chairman Chakda for calling this hearing and for your leadership. I also want to thank our agency partners, our legal service providers, community organizations, and most importantly, immigrant communities themselves for their resi resiliency in the face of these countless attacks that motivate our work each day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you and your team uh, for, for being here and, and really, I think, showing how, how we're committed as a city on this issue. Um, uh, before I ask any questions, I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Yeager and Joe and I from the Bronx and Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, this morning, we, we started the day, you and I, at 26 Federal Plaza uh, with Ravi uh, and Amy. And we were in the midst of a system. Uh, we were while we were there for, say, one person, we saw families go in and out of their check-ins, and, and it just reminded me the, the nature of, of, of this incredible beast and how arbitrary and um, how much power the federal government has. And, and what, what we were able to do was summon our responsibility as people who were stewards of our neighbors. And, and so it's just really important to get to the core of, uh, and by the way, at, Robbie now has six months before his next check-in, and the Congresswoman was there, and Congresswoman Clark, now um, an appointed member of the Oversight Board uh, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, is gonna be launching an investigation, and really, this is New York City. It is a, a blessing to be here and to be fighting alongside the advocate community and New Yorkers in general. Uh, this TPS piece just falls under so much shadow in so many ways, and I'm glad you acknowledged that too. Nationally, this is a community that, that we never thought in this unprecedented way that the government, the federal government, would be taking away these protections. That falls in the face of what they're there to do in the first place. Uh, so we're dealing with some really dark, dark times right now. Um, I wanna offer the opportunity for Councilmember Holden to ask a question or two. Are you ready for a question? A few minutes, great. So I'm gonna go in for, for a few questions. Um, you mentioned a kind of specific TPS-oriented, focused outreach days of action. And I wanna kind of go back to that and kind of give us a sense a little bit about what those services were, uh, when they happened, uh, how many people were, were in attendance, were these in communities, uh, partners. I'd like to get a good sense about, about how that worked. Mostly because I think we're going to want to partner on some future and getting a sense about how that actually happened sure. uh, would be helpful for us to know. Um, so 
when the decisions around TPS redesignation started to come down, we, along with many others, um, thought it more uh, pertinent to be coordinated in response. Um, we had, I think, our first meeting here at City Hall um, in Macau with a large number of community-based organizations, members from elected offices of elected officials, faith leadership and others, unions, um, essentially working together in conversation to determine what would be appropriate next steps in getting good information out to communities and to advocate uh, cohesively. From that, we um, began engaging in um, uh, with groups to deploy information to communities. We, we created our web page so that we could have timely update for people. We created community fact sheets that we continue to update um, regularly and share out the listed information on each country and got updated so people could have this information. We had these uh, translated into the various languages and disseminated to community partners and um, elected official offices. Um, we conducted a series of Know Your Rights forums, uh, many within uh, faith institutions, um, following days of service. Uh, we did town halls. Days of action were largely focused around community neighborhoods, bus stops, and other locations um, where the intended population that we were trying to reach would be congregated. Um, and um, largely with the support of volunteers, as I mentioned, disseminating the flyers that had the up-to-date information for each country on it and how to follow up with services if, if people were to need it. Um, we additionally did a, a PSA announcement through the city's phone uh, line, uh, held a number of press conferences jointly with the Coalition and Advocacy Partners, New York Immigration Coalition 1199, 32BJ, and others um, held the briefing calls, and we continue to do monthly coalition meetings with the tiers of stakeholders. I think, um, as we've seen with almost every issue, any which way you can kind of penetrate information is useful, so I wouldn't say that one particularly, one method in particular was the most um, relevant, I'd say we had a lot of success in working with um, the Liberian community on Staten Island to make sure that we were engaging effectively with that community as well and that they were a part of these conversations, as I noted, due to DED. Um, and just making sure that we were uh, being responsive to the needs as they were coming to us. So I think that th those efforts, those kinds of efforts are important, I think, supporting things like the national caravan that was organized by T TPS holders themselves as they made their way to Washington and welcoming them here in New York City are important in helping to ensure that we're continuing to elevate the voices of TPS holders <coughs> themselves um, and welcome additional thoughts and ideas and ways to partner. How, how effective do you think that it was? <laughs> uh, and I'm asking with the perspective of, of kind of general immigration outreach yeah. to communities, and this is a very particular thing, a uh, particular kind of benefit, uh, one that uh, has incredible uh, unlocking potential for a family, for work and driver's licenses, et cetera. How, how effective do you feel like Moya was in outreach? You know, TPS holders are a unique population, not too dissimilar from DACA recipients in that they've been here for so long they're so well established. Um, they've engaged with immigration so frequently in their own renewal period that a lot of the individuals who benefit from these uh, types of programs are, you know, are, I, again, I guess very well established and have their own ways of sort of going about those efforts. So, in terms of measuring success, I'm not sure there was a there was like a specific way to measure that something was successful in our mind. I think. We're continuing to sort of monitor uh, renewals and things like that, and the, the most important message for us was people knowing, uh, for instance, that there's an extension of their work authorization at this time, that they can get, um, uh, that they can continue to work and that they can get the legal advice if they need it. Um, but uh, other than sort of deeply penetrating information and working with community-based groups and faith leadership, 
um, which I do think was successful and people were responsive and a lot of what we heard in terms of feedback from community groups was, oh, I'm not affected but my neighbor is and I'm gonna share this information with them is, was really part of the goal as well. So um, I think it's, it's hard to measure effectively in terms of saying we wanted you know, Y to happen and X made it happen, but I think um, and that's largely due to the fact that these are communities who have been here for a very long period of time, have their own established ways of going through renewals, their own trusted providers or people that they've gone to or processes that they've gone about are stronger in the English language and so forth. And so um, I think hopefully the, the broad-based dissemination of information and the city's leadership in demonstrating that we were here to do what we could that was at our disposal gave people uh, the tools and the comfort that they needed through this time. I think what, what's, what's important here is, is clearly we're, we're, we're getting to a, a critical point soon. Hopefully the, the courts will favor our side of this question, but um, in preparation for this, I, I think we wanna get a better sense about what needs to happen and what we've learned in the past about this population a unique population that has a lot to lose and where you have the demographic that most uh, many of these families have american-born children so they're mixed status families uh, they're in integrated into our communities with work um, our economic their economic engine and so i think that's what we're trying to get a better sense of of how how we do that and i know advocates are gonna are gonna testify and think about that and hopefully, and I'll ask them, be ready uh, on how, what ideas they have so that we can meet them where they are and bring the resources. Is Moya yet prepared to think about, because uh, we're in the middle of the, be or I should say we're at the beginning of the next budget season, a, a plan with resources for specific outreach, and not necessarily just general outreach, but specific outreach to this community? Um, so one thing I would just note is I'd say that the labor unions are, are very effective partners in this work with TPS recipients um, and hugely critical to be in the, in the conversations, um, many of whom, of course, met their members are in the sectors where you see large numbers of TPS recipients and um, they were h highly critical and driven in, in getting good information out to their members and, and working in partnership to elevate the, the critical nature and need of, of this work. Um, in terms of ongoing need, you know, we, as I said, have been conti continuing to prioritize uh, appointments as needed for TPS holders. Um, we've not seen an issue there in terms of large numbers of people needing those appointments who, have, who haven't been able to get them. As I noted again, this is a population that's been going through this renewal pop process for so long that many people already have sort of their, their way of doing that and the trusted people that they go to. Um, in terms of outreach and education, we've started this work uh, over a year ago now in terms of being in communities and sharing information. We've sustained it um, since that time as needs have come up as, as we've been asked to um, do a Know Your Rights Forum and provide information. Um, and you know we'll continue to do that. Um, I think our focus at the moment is really advocacy at the federal level. Um, we think now is the time to ensure that Congress is taking seriously the need for a legislative solution for recipients and um, have learned through the work that we do um, and, advocate, and through advocates and others that we've spoken to that there just is a, a lot of need for education at the federal level for people to understand the importance of uh, TPS recipients having a permanent solution. So we're very focused at the moment in, in ensuring that we're doing that effectively. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about exactly the federal, uh, the role that you're playing at the federal level to, to do the advocacy? Sure. Um, so in working through Cities for Action, the coalition of, of mayors across the country, um, we are uh, doing regular engagement in, in terms of, uh, you know, checking the pulse on, on where, um, where there's appetite and where there is need for education around issues that are critical to our communities, our cities. 
um, TPS. We're, we're telling the story of the city of New York to the, to the federal exactly. community, the federal legislative exactly. body. Exactly, um, and not just the city of New York, and I think that's where the power of, of cities coming together is, right? Cities nationally experiencing the same uh, ramifications or impacts locally w based on these policies and TPS being one that's been a, a harder one to penetrate um, in terms of the narrative and in terms of people really understanding what the human impact will be. But cities deeply understand that and know that in a way that um, we're able to speak to it in a, in a different way than advocates and others have. So um, we're hoping to be able to play more of that role on this issue in the coming months, including a trip to DC um, with city partners. Awesome. I, I want to offer the opportunity to work with the city council on all of this, uh, and and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, Councilmember Holden. Uh, thanks, Commissioner, for your testimony. I just have a few questions. Uh, some of you, some of the questions were answered already, but um, so the uh, temporary uh, protected status is evaluated every six to 18 months for these countries that you're, you're talking about? Yes. And each time the, the, the person has to pay $495, is it? And based on, on, on just, so if they do it every six months, you, you have to pay 495 every six months. Is that ever done? So I, I might want to pause and get back to you on the number that you have to pay at every renewal. Um, I know it's different if you're applying for the first time versus a, versus a renewal of your work authorization card. So I want to get back to you on the exact number for just the renewal every 18 months. Okay. Yeah. And, and um, you said the Trump administration has evaluated six or nine countries, six to nine countries. Um, how many countries have TPS in the United States? Oh, let me get you, let me get to my chart so I don't give you the wrong information right. on this. So currently including um, Liberia, there are 11 countries. Um, and the Trump administration, as we noted, evaluated nine and chose not to redesignate six. So, um, so uh, there are 11 countries, you said? Um, which ones weren't evaluated? I'm sorry. Um, so I if it's okay, I'll just run down the list to make it a little bit easier. So Sudan, um, they chose not to redesignate. Niger Ni Nicaragua, they chose not to redesignate. Liberia, they chose not to redesignate. Um, uh, South Sudan, they extended. Haiti, they chose not to redesignate. Nepal, they chose not to redesignate. El Salvador, they chose not to redesignate. Syria, they did extend. Honduras, they chose not to redesignate. Yemen, they extended. And Somalia, they extended. And um, since it is TPS, it's temporary. Um, and in previous administrations, I know you've said that the Trump administration is targeting um, certain countries. Um, uh, can, can historically, has since it is TPS, I mean, it is lifted in previous administrations, hasn't it? I mean, obviously, because it wouldn't be called TPS. Mm -hmm. So um, would, could you go back historically and say how many times it's been lifted in other administrations for, for certain countries? Sure. So I'll, so I'll say a couple of things, and I'll, I'll start with what has been the most troubling or problematic about the approach of the Trump administration compared to previous administrations. Mm -hmm. um, the most problematic thing has been the way that they've gone about making the determination. So um, as I noted in my testimony, and as it been, has been a part of the practice since the 90s, Redesignations are based on current country conditions. So the ability for the individual to return safely to, to their country of origin and establish themselves safely. The Trump administration, again, against what their own country condition report said, against what own guidance that they, they were given, ignored current country conditions in the country of origin for individuals. So in terms of sort of process and um, uh, you know, some of the bases for the legal challenge, it's that they didn't procedurally operate as they ought to in, in considering TPS designation. I think that's the first and major thing I would say. The second is, I think, 
comprehensively, and nobody would dispute this, there's a broader question around the need for comprehensive immigration reform um, and things that work about our system and things that don't work in our system. And I think one of the, the important things to consider is, of course, what happens when uh, people have been established for over 15 years in a country, they have worked there, they have steady jobs, they have established themselves, they pose no threat, they have mixed status households. Um, there should be consideration for those factors and there should be a system that acknowledges that. So I think certainly in any conversation about the need for immigration reform, this would be a question. Um, do, do you keep track of how many actually, how many people go back to their original country voluntarily just because um, because uh, conditions have improved in that country? Do you, do you keep stats like that? I don't know. I'm not sure we would be able to get something like that, but we can certainly try to try to and get back to you if we can. So, th so the basis of, of the argument, though, is that you believe the conditions <coughs> have improved in, the, in those countries at all, in any of the countries, and that there should be some mechanism to apply for citizenship or at least t uh, uh, permanent status um, based on the fact that they've been here a long time, 15 years, let's say, or so, and have good jobs, let's say. Um, so what I'm saying is a couple of things. One, that I think the, the ki uh, this kind of program is an important kind of program. We're not, you know, we're not entering into a situation where you aren't, aren't going to see crises arise globally. In fact, we're seeing an increase in crises and will see an increase in crises around migration due to climate change. Um, and so I think the importance of programs that acknowledge um, that somebody should not be forced to go to an unstable, unsafe condition is a part of what we should value and who we are as a country and a society. Um, I think the reality of what plays out in countries and how long it takes to rebuild and so forth is something that I would hope would be considered in a conversation or in around comprehensive immigration reform and part of why what's happening to the countries that we're talking about right now and the individuals here in New York City is so critical to the conversation. We want to just make sure that legislators are educated about who these populations are, why it matters that they've been here for over 15 years and have children and are the primary bedwinners of their family and have established themselves every year paying taxes, not committing crimes and so forth. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Holden. We've also been joined by Councilmember Miller. Councilmember Miller, do you have questions? Go for it. Thank you, Chairman Chaka, uh, for your leadership once again. And uh, Commissioner, thank you as well for you and your team uh, that has demonstrated the support to these uh, folks that have been afforded uh, temporary protections in in our communities throughout the city of New York and that um, let me just say that uh, we appreciate the resources and the collaborations that have allowed us to support these communities within our communities Thank that you. really um, have, have become very important to our communities on so many different levels whether it's the economic or social fabric of, of who we are which speaks directly to the, the, the other line of questioning um, but for me I, I kind of just want to step outside of this box. I'm a little more familiar with, with what those protections look like and, and that we are kind of on pins and needles as we await a decision and, and next steps as we, we deal with those decisions um, that, that are upcoming. And, and uh, what is, is it three or four countries involved in the lawsuit? Six. How many? Six. Six actually involved in the lawsuit now? Oh, in the lawsuit, it's it's four. It's four, yes. right, and yep. the injunction and so forth. So there, there are a lot of folks that, that are on pins and needles. Let me ask you, um, is is those countries and those individuals uh, that, that have come here by virtue of catastrophes or, or other world events that, that they've experienced, um, and those who receive the temporary protective status, what other mechanisms, avenues, resources um, does the government provide uh, 
assistance do we provide uh, for um, individuals uh, from these countries that find themselves uh, in these type of predicaments? Um, in terms of public assistance? So this is a temporary protective status. I know that there are many such qualifying catastrophic events that happen, unfortunately, pretty regularly. As I take a look at this list, these are a list of, of, of folks and countries that are all black and brown, right? What opportunities are afforded to the, uh, the rest of the world that have equal uh, catastrophic events? Are they find themselves in simply temporary protective status or is there something else that grants them the opportunities to, um, that are being afforded to TPS and beyond. Is there something else that is missing and why aren't there folks that, why aren't there non and black and brown um, countries and folks from those countries on TPS? Is there something aside from TPS that assists these folks? Sure. There's uh, something that we're missing here? Um, so. As noted, I know, um, Council Member, you came a little bit late, but I did, as in my testimony, speak to how we, we believe very much that the decision to terminate these countries is motivated by anti-black and anti-Latinx racism at the federal level, um, and that that has been clear through the rhetoric um, and the lack of, of following uh, procedure in making these determinations. Um, I think in terms of what why do you see a, a host of countries listed that are all um, from, the, from countries that have predominantly people of color in them? I mean, we could probably have a whole history lesson about foreign policy and the way that it works that speaks to that, quite honestly, um, and speaks to the resources um, in, in some countries and, and the way that governments work in other, in other countries could, that could, actually result in. Could you very specifically say, and, and, and I can't grasp at a country, a European country or a non-country of color, but when they find themselves in these positions, are the only options available to them temporary protective statuses or are the government, federal government affording them opportunities that are be not being afforded to these to folks from El Salvador, Honduras, Haiti, Yemen, and Somalia, and other, the other West Coast African countries? Um, I mean, I, I think without a specific example, it's a difficult thing for me to answer that question. I would say that in terms of relief that are available for individuals who are in the United States at the time in which there might be some sort of civil or other natural disaster in their country that makes them unable to go home, as far as I'm aware, it would be similar, um, that there isn't a different kind of program that would be made available to one country versus another. I think it's more of a question of what are the, what are the sort of number of opportunities that might be made available to individuals from particular countries for different reasons, be it more freedom to travel to other places, to relocate if you're in the European Union, et cetera. Um. Not exactly what I was looking for. I was looking for something a little more definitive, uh, but I can appreciate uh, your answer. And um, thank you again, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to kind of listen to the rest of the, of the hearing and, and kind of ascertain. And maybe I'll hear what we're trying to get to and, and, and the same. I, I, but I think that um, the folks that are being it was just a simple question, is there outside of TPS anything else that are being afforded to folks that find themselves in the position that these folks aren't able to take advantage of a program outside of TPS that will allow them to remain here uh, with certain provisions and protections? Not that I'm aware of, but we can okay. get back to you, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Miller. And we've been also joined by Councilmember Matthew Jean from Brooklyn. I, I want to ask a question, but I want to also say that uh, maybe in relationship to your question, Councilmember Miller, when you look at the list of countries with the highest amount of TPS um, recipients, 
where 98 some percent are coming from those countries where this president has decided to uh, not renew. These are also countries, for the most part, related to incredibly horrible foreign policy in Latin America, where we have destabilized countries. And climate change is one piece, but we have also been a force of nature ourselves, uh, destabilizing so many countries that we're seeing people uh, continue to come to the United States. So there is there is a relationship there that I think we can we can talk about for a long time. Um, and, and so really what I want to figure out here is, uh, and also to Council Member Miller's question about what other immigration status benefits are available for TPS and have you done that study within Moya uh, for families that are residing here with at least one TPS recipient? And um, wait, hold on. Yeah, any benefits that are available to TPS recipients? And what, where is Action NYC in that outreach to be able to bring that benefit to those families for other options? Sure, you mean immigration benefits, yes? Immigration benefits. Yeah. Um, so that's a difficult question to answer for a number of reasons. One, it's a very individualized analysis. Um, so- Are I there any trends? So as I noted in my testimony, the primary way would be through a family member. Um, uh, uh, you know, marriage to a U.S. citizen spouse by way of example um, would be one way in which you could potentially, though not always, um, see a path towards immigration status for you. There's a number of litigations that have, um, in two circuits across the country, that have made it easier to adjust your status to permanent residence based on a marriage to a U.S. citizen. There's pending litigation in this in our in the Eastern District in New York on this question. Um, so it is a very complex and individualized um, question. It is more difficult for individuals who have TPS um, and are placed in deportation proceedings to, to obtain relief that might be available to somebody else who's been here for a long period of time and established themselves. Um, so it's, it's not something that can easily be answered. It's a very, very specific and very limited um, options and must be looked at per individual. Yeah, without immigration reform, we're not gonna be able to bring that kind of relief across the board and we're, we're trying to find ways and and that's all gonna take lawyers. It's gonna take legal representation. So back to this concept of cost and have you costed this out? Have you pulled together a budget for, if we were able to engage every single TPS recipient in the city of New York, how much would that cost to bring them a lawyer? This also touches upon due process and ensuring that every New Yorker gets access to a lawyer of some kind to take their individualized need and unique case and bring it forth and, and offer opportunity for justice, uh, especially in these mix, well, all for, for everybody, for everybody, what's the cost? Um, so we've not costed out specifically for this population. I'd say what we have done for this population, and this was similar to what we had done with um, when we saw the end for DACA, um, was wanted to ensure that we were doing what we could to maximize outreach and engagements, that we were establishing different entry points for people to get legal advice, and that we were monitoring and making sure that people who needed it were getting it, who were trying to come to us. I think what we saw, and, and I know Council Member Eugene has joined, thank you to him and his staff who were extremely great partners around uh, Haitian TPS renewals and we worked together to do both outreach as well as the legal <coughs> clinics through your office. So thank you so much for your work um, with communities in this space. Um, I think um, what we have seen in this regard is so far, we've been able to meet the, the demand of people who are coming to us. Again, I think- With the current budget. Mm -hmm, I think with, the, with this, these populations, as I noted, you're talking about people who have kind of year in and year out gone through the renewal um, process and nothing has necessarily changed in their lives um, that may necessitate them needing to get advice. Um, and so, you know, a little bit of of the the desire that we have had to make sure that everybody is getting that legal advice, um, to make sure that 
you know, you might not know if you have a, another pathway or you might not know what all the best options are for you, so we want you to get that screening is why we've also kind of doubled down on the community engagement and the more broader public outreach. Um, but we've not, you know, had the need at this time to make a determination or assessment that there, there's a broader need for the immigration legal services on this front. Thank you for that. I'm going to hand it over to Councilmember Matthew Jean for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you very much, as also Commissioner. Thank you. And we all know that TPS is a very important uh, immigration relief and humanitarian relief to people who have been living in the United States because of uh, their countries uh, have been through very difficult situation. It could be natural disasters and uh, uh, political turmoil and uh, other tragedies. But the reality is uh, those people who have been living in the United States, they are part, as you know, we all know that, part of the fabric of United States, and uh, especially uh, as, uh, because we are in New York City, part of the fabric of New York City. And um, those people, they are hardworking people also. As you know that uh, they come to my office, they go to the office of the city council members to renew the work permit. That says something. They want to work. They want to make sure they can contribute uh, you know, to the greatness of the city of United States. They want to make sure that they can maintain their families, pay their bills. And also they are part of the economy also. And, uh, but the problem is, uh, one of the problems that uh, we have been seeing all the time, when um, they have to renew their TPS, there's a gap, you know, when they apply to renew, to extend the TPS, some of the time they don't receive the new permit on time, right. the work permit on time, and the employers don't want to keep them. So that means many of them, unfortunately, usually uh, uh, lost their job. Mm -hmm. We have been doing a lot of things to contact the employees. Some of the time, we, you know, we succeed in doing that. All the time, certain employers say no. They want to see the physical, you know, uh, 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 extended permit. Are you aware of this as the, you know, the mayor office of immigration? You are at the mayor office of immigration. Are you aware of that? And what have been done? to uh, uh, try to help those people. They are qualified, they are waiting, they were waiting for the working permit, but because of, uh, you know, uh, 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 process, the process has been delayed, or uh, administrative uh, uh, issues, they didn't receive the work permit on time. Are you aware of that situation? What have been done to help those people, you know, uh, uh, stay in their job? Sure, thank you for the question. So I'm aware of it, of it on maybe kind of a couple cases here and there, but not as a, a much broader widespread issue um, that we have worked on, though something we're interested in learning more about and helping to work on as needed in terms of advocacy. I'd say that this is a challenge more broadly with USCIS in that there are many delays in issuance of decisions on a wide range of cases, not just TPS. So um, that is an issue that we have talked about with the local office and we'll, are interested in continuing to advocate around. So as you're hearing cases, please do share information with us um, so that we can more effectively ascertain you know, how prevalent this is and what the challenges are. As I noted before, in the current situation where people are receiving simply the announcement that their status is extended um, and no new card to, to verify that. We have heard that this is a challenge um, and that's something that we're, we're interested in just making sure we understand and can be responsive and advocate around. Mm -hmm. As I said before, and all of us, we know that because uh, we have been advocating for people, for immigrants, the people who benefit from TPS, as I said, they, they want to work. And many of them, they want to uh, 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 learn something, to be able to, 
to uh, get a better economical situation, go to the nurses there, get the trade. Yeah. But because, uh, you know, the benefit for TPS is are very limited. If they don't have money, they cannot go to a school to learn something. But uh, can the mayor office of immigration uh, create some type of grant f or funding or create a system or try to work together with for the school to allow those people to have at least uh, the opportunity to go to school to get a certificate, a diploma for something. I'm not talking about go to medicine, go to law school, but some trade that will ab enable them to better contribute to the society, to New York City, because e better prepared they are, better it's going to be for New York City also. It's going to be a win-win situation. Yep. Is there anything that, you know, you from the, you know, the mayor office is thinking about? Is there anything that you believe that should be done? Um, because they're already here. Yeah. They're already here. That's right. And they are legally here. You know what I'm saying? So if we can help them to empower themselves, by doing that, we are empowering also the city of New York. Yeah. Is there anything that can be done in that, uh, 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 you know, uh, area? Yeah, I thank you for your question. I think that's definitely something that we would like to look at and potentially work on with you. <laughs> Excuse me. If you have particular ideas or thoughts on the kinds of either licenses, skills, or training that would be beneficial to um, TPS populations that you're working with or others, we'd definitely love to explore that. Okay, my last question is this one. We all know that, you know, <laughs> there's a big issue at the wall, <laughs> the big issue. And one of the uh, uh, conditions, <coughs> you know, for this president to get to open the government, or even the, op the government is open now, but the package that he presented, it was, okay, I will give DACA, you know, uh, TPS, if you give me this, you give me the money for the world. What I'm thinking about is, uh, is there any advocacy, anything that the city of New York can do? Because now that means TPS, DACA, they're part of the conversation, yes. for good or for bad. But for us, advocate for uh, immigrants, is there anything that we can do or the city of New York can do to make sure that we are part of the conversation and we put some weight and to, 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 to present TPS or DACA you know, as a very important uh, topic, very important subject, very important issue, and then to make sure that you know, regardless of which way the decision will go, TPS and DACA can be considered, and those people who are waiting for those benefits can, you know, see a good day, can benefit, can be granted uh, the TPS or DACA. Yeah, so thank Any, you. you know, advocacy, any force, anything that we can put on that. Yeah, so thank you for the question. I spoke a little bit about this. Um, one of the things that we've done already is, um, We've joined the litigation nationally through Amicus Brief with multi-city Amicus Brief. Um, we also, through our coalition, Cities for Action, have um, jointly uh, shared the city's perspective on each of the TPS considerations. Um, and we have, um, in the coming months, an agenda to help educate um, congressional representatives around TPS, including a trip to DC, a multi-city trip to DC around this to elevate the importance of um, this issue for cities, um, what our communities look like, what the impact would be, and why it's so important to ensure that there is a permanent solution for our TPS residents. Thank you very much. Uh, before I conclude, let me uh, take the opportunity to thank you also to thank the Mayor Office of Immigration more, because uh, I've, I've, I've s have seen the effort that you have been doing to reach out to people with uh, TPS and special Asian community by uh, organizing Know Your right, right and many other forums to inform them about their right and also to give them the necessary information that they need, not only to keep their TPS, to renew their TPS. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, thank you so very much. Thank you. you so much, Councilmember Eugene, and thank you for your advocacy. Uh, it, it just 
it goes to show how important we are as partners in the city council for our communities and uh, your connection and leadership in the Haitian community is incredibly important to the larger city-wide uh, platform of, of outreach. And so we're gonna keep working together, no doubt. So I have a few more questions uh, before we bring the advocates on board. And I really wanna nail down this uh, understanding of Action NYC. What's the role of Action NYC for TPS? Uh, and or specifically, what is Action NYC doing for the TPS community? Um, right there. <laughs> sure. So, you know, Ac Action NYC is the city's sort of entry point for immigration legal services, as we like to call it, um, in that you can, if you call 311 or the hotline, you know, you don't have to go to a particular location to get an appointment, but you can call wherever you are in the city, you can get an appointment. Um, 311 is essentially the face of, of the response. <laughs> is that? No. Um, 311, you can if, if you don't know the hotline number, you can just call 311 and they'll connect you to the Got hotline. Got it, the right? Action NYC yes. hotline number. Yep. Okay. Um, regardless of your language, we have interpretation available, et cetera. Um, and you can get an appointment uh, made. And what we did um, with that was we just made sure that we were prioritizing re-registration appointments for TPS holders. So you didn't have to wait to come in because you could miss your deadline, right? Um, so. That was what we were we were doing with TPS recipients to just ensure that they had the ability to come in and quickly get an appointment and didn't have to wait a couple of weeks if they needed to come in tomorrow because the deadline was looming they could do that. Can I can I pause and ask about the calls? So how how did the calls measure in terms of other calls that were coming in to the hotline slash three one one? Did TPS kind of go up at all over the last? So I don't have the exact number for you. I can get back to you, but I don't recall okay. us, us seeing a huge spike in terms of TPS calls. Okay, let's do that. I'd like, like to see that yeah. as well. We're doing a lot of 311 stuff, and I, and I know we're going to be working on some of the legislation for kind of language access. Yep. But, um, but we won't go there right now. Um, what are the most common questions when someone calls about TPS? What, what are the, what's the, the quality of the question? What, what, what are they asking for? Sure, so um, if you're calling because you, you what our, uh, what the hotline should be doing is when you call, they're, they're just assessing, do you have TPS, right? If you have TPS, what country is it from and is your deadline looming, right? Do you need to get in sooner than later and let's make sure we can get you in. Um, if you, if that's what it is, then that's sort of the process that they're going through to make sure. If you just have a broader question about the program or what's happening with it, um, then we have partnered with the um, Office of New Americans Hotline so that our our um, our hotline can transfer to get a kind of more in-depth uh, responsiveness there. We've also recently hired on board a counselor who can go a little bit more in-depth for with callers just to make sure we're not missing anything and um, can address things quicker and right off the bat as people are calling us for broader information and not just the need for the immigration legal service appointment. When you get connected to the provider, all of the Action NYC providers can take can do those TPS renewals. Um, so they can they can do the full um, scope of it. Um, probably the largest uh, Action NYC provider that sees the most TPS cases is probably Canva in Brooklyn. Um, and I know they were, uh, you know, working all over the weekends um, during the Haitian renewal period to make sure that they were seeing the, the population and they were able to meet all of the need. Um, in terms of uh, if you have a more complex case, if you have the possibility of um, needing uh, services to reopen a deportation case or what have you, then they will help make the referral to an IOI provider to be able to take those cases. Awesome, thank you. And that, that reminds me about thinking about other city agencies and partnering with them to do outreach. Yep. So many of them, um, uh, so many of those agencies interact with, with, with possible population um, yes. kids, the Department of Education. Uh, ACS, DYCD, HRA, SBS, in terms of the workforce, 
Can you give us a, a sense, maybe kind of go one by one on each of those agencies and how, how Moya is working with them to do that outreach, if there's any? Sure, so um, kind of top lines, and this is what we've put into place on all sort of major federal policy shifts. We immediately do a multi-agency briefing call where we invite agencies to join to make sure that they have the immediate sort of top line information. We share out um, information like our outreach flyer um, and talking points for staff to make sure that they're sharing good information and can immediately connect people to services, not just, of course, um, people that they're interacting with, but city workers who might have questions and might be impacted. Um, and we, we've worked closely with um, general counsel offices as well for that purpose. So um, that's a part of what we do. We also do individual um, support or technical assistance for agencies as cases arise. So I, I guess what mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also trying to understand too is, it, um, for the lack of a better word, mm -hmm. I'm gonna use the word uh, passive sure. outreach, where, uh, and I struggle with that too in the district office, yeah. where we're like going totally. out and we're just kind of blanketing the neighborhood and everybody's got the information, but really trying to understand how we know when information has been received yeah. and and we're able to kind of get a good feedback loop going with communities over time. TPS is, is one very kind of unique community, but that'll probably change over time again. And if we sure. win the port battle and and so how do we, how do we had are there any non passive kind of direct measurable connections that we're making at the agency levels uh, in any way? I don't know, and that might not be measurable. I know we we hit privacy issues and we hit yeah. like we don't want to create lists and I, and I get that right. but is there anything else that's beyond at the agency level I can't think of anything right now I think if I think of something else I'll get back to you but I okay. think you're right in the challenges that we come up against in that we're not advising agencies to ask these questions yeah. we're not asking agencies to tally um, you know the the TPS recipients that they are serving or DACA recipients most don't know because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're not supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. um, and yeah. so it is for us a lot more about just making sure we can disseminate good information in a timely way and ensure that they can be responsive effectively um, and share information proactively, knowing that they might have uh, you know, TPS recipients coming into their service center or to their school and that they can be, be responsive in that way. I'd say the work that we do in partnership with advocacy community, with the labor unions, with the faith leadership is a lot more intentional and targeted, mm -hmm. right? We're working um, on using our own data on where communities live and doing our own analyses, but also in working with um, those communities who are trusted voices and leadership um, and making sure that information gets disseminated effectively um, and in all, all of the right ways, you know, visiting Yemeni mosques and uh, making sure that we're um, speaking to the Haitian clergy and making sure that we're, we're uh, working with the Liberian community-based organizations in Staten Island. All of that has been probably the most fundamental in effectiveness in reaching harder to reach populations. Um, but have your your um, questions as well in terms of how do you best best measure those outputs and it's difficult. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and the last two areas of questions are about different sectors uh, who are po poised to lose work authorization and whether whether Moya has done research around what, what sectors are we talking about in terms of TPS uh, through trends and and what what are we doing uh, to understand that sector when they lose a predominant TPS workforce and then also kind of thinking about outreach to employers uh, and, and whether that's already kind of done or whether you're gonna, that's a strategy that Moya is employing later. So um, in terms of um, workforce, our analyses has shown us specifically for the Haitian TPS population as we put in our, in our fact sheet that 42% of TPS holders from Haiti are actually in the education and health service industries. We ended up as a result of that doing a lot of work with um, health service uh, workers, um, nurses, nurse associations and others in the outreach and engagement that we were doing around this work. 
I think that will continue, that kind of information will continue to guide um, the way that we uh, go about um, doing that, that information education work, but also just about un understanding how best to serve the needs of the population. Um, and as I noted earlier, I'd say the labor unions were hugely important in this um, fight, in this battle, and um, certainly from the restaurant industry to the health industry, a lot of their members are TPS recipients. Let's, let's end with health care, mental health care. Sure. Uh, you talked about what I think everybody understands, even anecdotally, but there's data about toxic stress and how we're working with our communities to ensure that they get access to good mental health care. Yeah. So I want to kind of hear from you what Moya is doing with um, what I believe is one of the large, one of the larger new programs and initiatives to thrive NYC. So I want to kind of hear a little bit about any targeted TPS programs for mental health, and then also the work that you're doing at the state level to ensure that, like DACA, um, we are going to have a positive response from the state in making sure that we can continue the healthcare access for TPS if we get to that point where TPS uh, expires. Sure. So um, as um, as I noted, um, in a lot of the outreach and community engagement, we provided information. The information was not limited to legal services. It was also it also included how to connect to Thrive and get. Co can we get a co that copy? Is that? I don't think we have that, right? We don't have that here. But oh, we just can we get to the st ser Sergeant of Arms, please? Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Sorry. Continue. Um, oh, of course. Um, it also included how to connect to, um, to Thrive um, and, and NYC Well. Um, in terms of broader uh, engagement and outreach, that was also a centerpiece of what we were um, hoping and trying to ensure that people could immediately access as they needed it. Um, we work closely with Thrive at looking at how they're reaching the immigrant community more broadly and specifically those um, that we've we understand are in crises moments, um, which unfortunately is a lot of the immigration community at this time, um, uh, <coughs> to, to better their outreach and engagement and also their service and competency in reaching these populations. And that's work that we will continue to undertake um, and work with um, the newly appointed director of Thrive, um, Susan Herman. So uh, we'll continue to do that work. I'd also note that um, as you heard the mayor announce um, earlier with the state of the city with NYC CARE, a component of NYC CARE is looking at um, expanding the mental health services that are available to New Yorkers regardless of status um, and helping to increase access through the mental health service score, which we have found to be really critical in reaching these populations. And is there anything that's specific to TPS populations that is being developed because uh, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing, and, and correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially you're you're doing outreach. This is a Moya flyer, so Moya saying, "Hey, hey, really great review on the back of all the um, all the countries," sure. and then on the other side saying, "Here are all the services." But is is NYC Thrive or NYC Well doing very kind of targeted from their perspective? outreach for TPS recipients? So we've, cr we've cross-trained the Thrive team on these things. Um, I can't speak to specific things that they've done, but can well, get like back campaigns. to you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I so let's work on that. Yep. And just understanding yeah. if that exists or, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm getting prepared for the budget hearing yep. and trying to figure out what, what the gaps are yep. for services. And not just for Moya, for you to do your work and continue that work, but also from the agencies themselves to be able to do that work. And the last thing we want is for them not to have that resource yeah. to be able to do that work on their own. Especially if you're building comp competency at the agency level, they should be able to kind of generate their own thing yeah. and not wait for you to do that. Um, that's my opinion. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I think that's it for us, unless you have any other final comments. Um, I will have one final comment f uh, just as we talk. And Councilmember Miller made me think about this in terms of how we got here and, and the, the, the fact that these countries are countries uh, that are connected to this concept that we understand as, as people of color. Um, we're, we're being led, uh, this president has incredible connections to the values around white supremacy. 
the reason why we're having the border issue, the reason we're having this issue is because he's trying to whiten America. He's trying to deport people who do not look like him and, and the white race. And so that, that for me is very true, and I will say it any time I have the opportunity to say it, and that's what, we're, that's what we're dealing with. Temporary protected status, as you laid out, as we laid out, has origins around protecting people who are in crisis. The crisis is still alive. The crisis was generated by us as, as a U.S. and our foreign policy, and I just needed to say that, and thank you for your work, and I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you. As we move forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, with that said, we're gonna go on to our first uh, public panel. And uh, uh, New York, uh, NYLPI, uh, Elena Roman, please. Uh, Amal Dodd, the African Communities Together. Uh, Amaha Kasa, African Communities Together as well. And then Sami uh, Aliameni, the Arab American Association of New York. And if anybody else wants to testify, has, is anybody want to testify that has not filled out a form? See the Sergeant of Arms, fill it out. Okay, uh, who wants to begin? Please. Just introduce yourself, and then you can, can move forward. Um, I want to put a clock. I want to put a clock for three minutes, and then we could we could go to Q and A. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ileana Roman, and I am the Health Justice and Immigration Staff Attorney at the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Thank you to Chairperson Menchaca and the committee members for having this oversight hearing. NOPI urges the council to support health care coverage for at-risk TPS holders who may lose their immigration status. For the population of immigrants, we serve those with serious health conditions. Losing health care coverage would have devastating consequences. It would mean clients who currently have state-funded Medicaid could be unable to obtain the life-saving surgeries or transplants they need because they would not they would be unable to obtain the life-saving surgeries or transplants they need because they would not have the necessary health insurance to cover their procedures. The city and state need to protect these New Yorkers and guarantee health care coverage for them in the future. Um, we have clients in our Indaki care program who have applied for temporary protected status and are currently TPS holders. Um, as you know, the Trump administration aims to eliminate TPS for six out of nine countries. These folks have lived in the United States for several years and some for decades. Ending their TPS status not only uproots them from their families, homes, jobs, and communities, it would also mean potentially ending their health care coverage. For our clients, this would mean the difference between treating end-stage renal disease with dialysis or with a kidney transplant. Dialysis is covered by emergency Medicaid and means that the client must spend several hours over multiple days connected to a machine for survival. Um, di dialysis will not cure their disease, um, and they will have to go for dialysis permanently in order to live. Whereas a kidney transplant, which is covered by state-funded Medicaid, would fix the disease and allow our clients to have healthy, protective lives. Um, NOPI is a part of Coverage for All, a campaign of healthcare for all New York. Coverage for All demands state action to create an essential plan for all New Yorkers up to 200% of the federal, federal poverty level regardless of immigration status, with particular urgency for immigrants who will, be, who will be losing their temporary protected status. So New York City should affirmatively step forward in, in supporting the Coverage for All campaign and should urge the state to act on behalf of all New Yorkers and to protect TPS holders. Furthermore, should the state not choose to continue coverage for, for former TPS recipients, we encourage the city to step in and provide comparable coverage that will maintain the specialist care these individuals currently receive and acquire. If both state and city fail to provide this needed coverage, many TPS holders could be at risk. Ultimately, it's up to the city and state to step in and advocate for TPS applicants since the current federal administration is actively aiming to harm these individuals. Thank you for your consideration today. Um, we look forward to continuing to work with the council and to improve immigrant New Yorkers' access to health care. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have some questions for you after the panel. Good afternoon, 
uh, Chairman Chaka. Um, thank you for convening this hearing and thank you for your attention to this issue. Um, as you've said, temporary protected status is a critical issue in our political landscape. Um, and part of not only a broader attack on legal mechanisms to immigrate to the United States, things like the diversity visa program, refugee resettlement, and asylum, um, but as you've said, uh, has been clearly uh, informed by animus, which is the basis of the Ramos, uh, Ramos v. Nielsen lawsuit, which my organization, African Communities Together, is one of the plaintiffs um, on that and our Sudanese members. Um, my name is Amaha Kasa. I'm the executive director of African Communities Together. I'm also an immigration attorney. I'm here with our member, Amal Dawood, who's a TPS holder from Sudan, and my colleagues, Asafach Makonan and Kadim Niang, um, to both uh, add a little bit of context about what's going on for TPS holders and to build on the ideas about how the city can support um, some of the current issues that they are facing. Um, my organization has worked on temporary protected status reauthorization and directly with TPS holders for the six uh, African countries that have, ha that have or have held the status or deferred enforced departure, which is the parallel program uh, to TPS that's enacted under presidential authority. Um, those countries are, include Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, um, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Um, Liberia is under both the temporary protected, or has been under both the temporary protected status and deferred enforced departure programs. Um, I want to make sure we don't forget about Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, which were terminated at the tail end of the uh, Obama administration. We're very grateful to Congresswoman Velasquez and to Congresswoman Clark uh, for including relief for those West African TPS holders who were granted TPS under the, uh, as a result of the Ebola epidemic um, in their bills in the previous Congress. And we want to continue to work uh, with those members of Congress, with Congressman Jeffries, who's in a key leader position, and uh, the city to ensure that that they're also included in advocacy going forward. Um, as well as Liberian DED, because it doesn't have the same acronym, it's sometimes forgotten. Um, I think two things to highlight for potential resources and support. Um, one is the need for social work. Uh, as people said, um, uh, there's a variety of programs eligibility that, that people no longer qualify for. People need navigation assistance, not just le immigration legal assistance. Um, second is the need for um, uh, assistance with fees. Um, we can no longer recommend to people that they apply for a fee waiver because of how lengthy the process is, has, has become. Um, and so are there ways that the city can step in and help provide um, uh, for people who qualify for fee, who would, would qualify for fee waivers, fees in lieu of what the federal government is providing. And very last thing with your indulgence, um, the practice of refusing to honor work authorizations issued by the government because they are not based on a, on a physical identification card is widespread. Um, uh, Amal is gonna speak to it as well. It is actually illegal. It's a form of discrimination based on national origin. We are referring those cases primarily to the Department of Justice's uh, Division of Immigrant and Employee Rights, um, which does do investigation and enforcement. We'd love to partner more with the city on that, um, looking at agencies like the Human, Re uh, Human Rights Commission, um, because that is an illegal form of discrimination based on national origin. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Good afternoon. My name good afternoon. Is, yeah, good afternoon. My name is Amal Daoud. I'm TBS holder. I'm from Sudan. Uh, I, I, I have been living here in USA like 22 years or uh, 22 years now. Um, just come with my uh, <laughs> African community to just show up like what is going on. W will you say a word about the, the job? The yeah, job the my, yeah, the job, yeah, because the, I, I suffered from my job like 2017 from uh, uh, November because I don't have the, the ID. And they, I don't get it until uh, April, now 2018. And from that time I go to work back, but uh, I stop again in November, November. For that reason, I'm, I'm just home and do some job like job like to go my, uh, do what I have to do because I have big family, I have to do something. Thank you, and, and I wanna ask you some questions uh, right after we're done with all the testimony. Hi, my name is Sammy, and I am an immigration advocate at the Arab American Association of New York. 
I also work under Action NYC. Our organization serves all immigrants of NYC who walk through our doors. The people who come to us for TPS do so because their countries are experiencing crisis like war, national disaster, or ongoing violence. TPS allows our clients to support their families. They pay taxes, get married, and start new families, and then invest in our country. A perfect example of this is our client, Sarah. She's a 90-year-old widow from Syria who came to the States in the 90s. When she first heard of TPS in 2012, she immediately applied for the benefit. Sarah was so happy that she could finally work legally in the United States. Sarah had been a chef for 20 years and she enjoys cooking for people. Back in Syria, she has nine children who she still supports. With the money that she sends back home, her family was able to build a, a house where they can all live together. It's so important that we keep fighting for TPS because so many people are still at risk in their home countries. For example, the 7.8 or 8.1 magnitude earthquake of April 2015 in Nepal not only displaced people but led to rising expenses, accumulation debt, and homelessness. Most of our clients at AAANY are fleeing war-torn countries or natural disasters, and we have real-life experience in dealing with clients who flee to the U.S. for safety. Another example is my client, Mr. A, who fled the war from Yemen. Mr. A did not attend college because he was afraid of being killed or kidnapped. He came to America because Arab countries aren't accepting refugees. All he wanted was to go to school and become a police officer. Mr. A came to America, applied to colleges, and realized his dreams that he could not realize in his country. One of our clients that left a huge impression on me of strength and will was Mr. M, an elder man from Yemen who is unfortunately diagnosed with cancer. He currently has TPS. I'm sorry that this is important to me because he reminds me of my father who passed away from cancer. And it's so hard that he has to worry about TPS instead of focusing on his cancer treatments. Thank you. And thank you for the work that you're doing every day um, with the association. Uh, you're incredibly supported by the city council and you're absolutely right. This is not something that should be happening. This is incredibly cruel and is not at all uh, humane. And this is why we're here. And so thank you for lifting that story up. This is, this, is, this is the work ahead of us, and I'm hoping that your panel really helps us understand how we can do better on the ground and support these families that should be focused on their health, should be focused on their relationships that they've built with their family here in the United States, in New York, in Brooklyn, and, um, and with us, their neighbors. Uh, and so thank you for, for all of you for, for being here to, to ensure that we stay focused. Um, I wanna start and think about healthcare and really thinking about how the strat, well, and what is the strategy at the end of the day? Because even if we lose TPS, um, Mr. M should be able to have access to healthcare. And so what's the strategy? I, I asked Moya this, this question and, and so I, I wanna hear your perspective. How real is it that the state and what's the process for the state to grant us that access like they did with DACA? Is this the governor saying yes? Is that where the pressure needs to go? Is it the legislative process? And what can we do to help? Mm -hmm. um, well, it, it's the legislative process because there's going to be um, money involved in kind of ensuring that um, TPS holders and, and even broader than TPS holders um, are getting access to um, health care coverage, specifically to state-funded Medicaid. Um, and so coverage for all, um, the larger campaign that NOPE is a part of, is pushing the state um, to invest in this essential plan. Um, Do we have numbers? Is there, are there numbers generated right now about how, how many dollars? Yes, we certainly do, and I, I can send you um, kind of that okay. sheet of information. Um, I, I uh, don't have it handy right now, but it's um, a portion of the budget that the state could um, could afford to pay if they um, treated it as uh, a priority, um, something along the lines of um, 500 million, but I, I could give you the exact number um, 
afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and is, do we know if? Because to be honest, I will confess I did not listen to the governor's state of the. Yeah. State. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, did he mention it in his state of the state? He did not. He did not. No. Exactly. Okay. So this is very important. It is very important. Okay. And and clues us in to the priorities. Okay, Definitely. so we have some work to do on, on that front and, and on the legislative side for the state. And and as the chair of the Committee on Immigration, I'm going to ensure that this gets onto our state agenda as we move forward for budget negotiations in April that are upon us. Yeah. Um, and so, good, good, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you uh, so much. Right there. Uh, I want to ask in general for the panel how how are you partnering with Moya or other city agencies on this particular question, on TPS, renewals, support, healthcare, et cetera? Are, is there a link, a direct link, between you and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs? So African Communities Together is, uh, is a contractor, is part of uh, the, both the Action NYC and, uh, and IOI programs um, through a collaborative called SILAC, Citywide Immigrant Legal uh, Empowerment Collect, uh, Collaborative, um, that is providing direct immigration legal services. Um, so we uh, partner with legal service providers, including, including Catholic Charities, Catholic Migration Services, um, and um, uh, community development project of Urban Justice Center and Make the Road. And then our community-based organizations, which include Adikar, who's also here, and a number of other immigrant community-based organizations, um, we refer clients to legal service providers. Um, so um, we organize clinics in our own offices, lawyers come to us, um, we provide the language access. You know, we're uh, you know we're providing services in you know a range of languages, including Madi you know Madigo, uh, Fulani, Yor uh, Yoruba, a number of others, um, and uh, and and through that, people are accessing immigration legal services. We also are doing um, know your rights outreach. Um, and you know, to speak to some of the earlier questions, we've done we've everything from um, national conference calls with the Liberian community or with other communities uh, facing termination of TPS, um, to events in um, churches, mosques, and associations. Um, when, as the you know, when when a termination is happening or is about to happen, we hear a sort of a tidal wave. We, you know, we get, they're they're the folks who are who are calling us and and trying to find out what's going on. And so um, through city support, we've done that. I do think that um, there you know we can continue to deepen that partnership, um, you know, in other ways that we've talked about. Well, and specifically, I want to follow up on your concept of social workers rather than. Uh, only focus on legal legal services. What's what's that model, and have you presented that model in full with a budget and structure that's in preference to your your liking? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll I think we've had I've had informal conversations with the commissioner about this, and and um, but we haven't developed introduced a proposal. Um, what I would say is that the one of, one of the biggest initial challenges we face is trust. Um, you know that the people are less trusting um, than ever of uh, not only government, but even not-for-profit providers, you know, that people are afraid of providing their information, afraid of being honest with their own attorneys and advocates about their situation. Um, and so that's an issue for everyone, but I think um, we are able to get past that by, you know, hiring culturally competent people, people who speak the same language, working within trusted institutions like churches, mosques, and associations. Um, so when people come to us for these kind of immigration legal services, I want to see if I qualify for any um, uh, you know, form of immigration relief, or I need help with my, with my you know, um, adjustment of status. They don't come with one issue, right? People come with issues. Um, I, I want to apply for a DV. Um, uh, you know, a, a visa based on DV, um, but they also need help getting a divorce. They also need help finding housing. Um, the, in the case of TPS holders, um, often people are having these kinds of issues with workplace enforcement or um, with the Department of Mo Motor Vehicles. Um, and often, we're, you know, I, I think the city has done a phenomenal job at directing resources towards 
direct legal services and to know your rights and outreach. Um, but I think outside a handful of the largest legal services providers, the community-based organizations like ourselves, like Adhikar, um, you know, I don't, I'm not as familiar with Arab American, but um, most of us don't have, for example, a licensed social worker on staff who could help navigate for people and help direct, you know, do case management um, with people. And oftentimes when we try to refer them to one stops or to other things, um, they, they, they get lost in the system. Um, they never get past the, the automated greeting. Um, so um, I think- You're referring to city agencies or you're referring to other nonprofits? Uh, city funded nonprofit agencies. Yeah. You know, okay. um, I, think, I think it's just, I think they, they, they are um, providing an incredibly valuable service and, and dealing at a volume that we couldn't, you know, we as community based organizations couldn't hope to yeah. do. Um, I feel that right. we as community based organizations can reach some more disconnected and hard to reach um, community members. And so, a relatively small initiative, you know, engaging some of our schools of social work like Silberman and, um, and you know, uh, some of the private uh, schools of social work as well at Columbia and NYU, um, in putting uh, uh, licensed social workers in immigrant community based organizations to help with navigation on the front line, I think could have a huge impact. I agree. And I think what we should do is actually uh, set up a meeting uh, with your team and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and our team and just look at it together. Uh, I think that we're, we're going to hear from legal service providers, but they're asking for almost the same kind of thing. They're, um, well, and I don't have to tell this room. I mean, this, this, is, the, this is the question. It's almost like the, the, the mover, um, the lubricant of the, of the system. Uh, so that pe so that people can move through it smoothly and with purpose and not to be lost, and otherwise it it just jams up and we lose a person. And and once you break trust with a New Yorker, they will not come back <laughs> to yeah. either a three one one when they lose when we lose them at three one one, which is what we're trying to fix right now, um, when they call or or at an organization. So this is great. Let's let's table that and say let's come up with something because I think it should be part of our budget negotiations and we should be working all as a team. I don't know if Moya will agree with that um, <laughs> invitation or take that invitation, but it'll be offered. Uh, thank you for that. And then and then I think the last thing I want to get a better sense about is the ID situation and the worker permit. Um, what what happens in a situation where you don't have your your ID? How how is it? I don't know if I can ask this question or if we should talk offline, but in 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 general, what what happens when a TPS holder does not have work authorization paperwork? How's that? What causes that? Mm -hmm. And yeah, tell me a little bit more about what that problem is. So there, uh, you know, there there's sort of several buckets of of people in different statuses right now. Um, uh, there are people who've outright had their term their status terminated. Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone. They've been terminated since 2017. Um, there are also people who've had their status extended, Somalia uh, and, uh, and South Sudan. Um, and so uh, there they, ru they run into the issue of um, it's taking a really long time to get new work authorizations. And in that interim period, what they're supposed to do is, you know, go to their employer with a printout from the CIA, USCIS website and say, here's my expired work card, here's, my, here's the notice from the website, you should honor this as proof of my continuing work authorization. Um, as, you know, Councilman um, uh, Eugene and others have mentioned, some employers just don't. Uh, you know, they just say, you know, that's not good enough, get me the card. Um, and as the delays grow longer and longer, um, uh, and as more and more people face termination, um, that becomes a more and more common situation. I think there's a special situation for the four countries, Haiti, El Salvador, uh, Nicaragua, and Sudan, um, that, have, uh, that are part of the Ramos v. Nielsen lawsuit. Um, I think they're facing even more issues because um, the guidance on the federal website has not been as clear. Um, and so they're the, essentially, as, as Amal described, what happens is they, people present this work authorization and it's rejected. And as I said, that's illegal. It's a form of, um, you know, uh, it's a form of national origin discrimination. Um, but the enforcement uh, it gets difficult. And then the DMV issue also happens where people come in um, with these same forms of authorization and if the frontline worker doesn't know, um, they just say, no, what, what is this? You know, it should be a, a card. And so we've seen people turned away and especially for people who drive Uber or Lyft or, or, or yellow cabs, um, 
those, uh, that is also a loss of livelihood. Um, what was your experience, Amal? Do you want to share? When you when you gave your card to your employer? Yeah, they need the ID. They say because I expired the ID. They don't accept it. Uh, what they don't like what I'm going to say. When you had every right to be accepted with what you were presenting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And okay, so I'd like to learn a little bit more about this and what we. So what 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 can we do at the city council? I think um, convening a conversation maybe with some of the advocates um, you know, that are in the room, um, Moya, and then possibly with the Human Rights Commission, um, oh. and, and yeah. you know, thinking about does this fall within the scope of the city's human rights uh, ordinance, or what is the enforcement mechanism? Um, I think the Department of Justice has been somewhat successful in just calling employers and telling them actually people have a legal right to do this. Um, the, they're overwhelmed. There's, I think there are two staff attorneys for this entire division uh, at DOJ. Um, and so, you know, if we, can, if we can have people saying, listen, I'm sure you're not meaning to intentionally to discriminate um, by national origin, but you actually are required by law to accept valid work authorization. Thank you. So let's, let's come up with a, a meeting and, and just talk, even if it's on the phone quickly, just so we can get a better sense. And again, all, all this is to say we, we have to build a budget that's going to be responsive. And if this is about a resource question, we want to know that sooner rather than later. But everything from social workers to advocacy, uh, thinking about the state so that we can get Mr. M's story in front of folks that are in the middle of their legislative victories right now at the state where we have progressive new leadership, uh, where we have two Democrat, well, three technically Democrats leading the state that we can try to get some of this stuff done. And, and I think that's important. Thank you all for your testimony and your time today. Uh, our next panel we have Nilag. Uh, Jody Zeismer, Zeismer uh, Margaret Garrett from the Legal Aid Society, and Tracy Lawson from Brooklyn Defender Services. Are there any other legal services in the room that wanted to testify? Okay, this is it. This is our legal services panel. <laughs> you got it. All right. Who wants to begin? I can begin. Okay. Yes. So, hi. Thank you. Um, Chairman Chaka and council members and staff. Um, my name is Jody Seesmer. I'm here from the New York Legal Assistance Group. Um, I'm the new director of their Immigrant Protection Unit. I'm here with Melissa Chua, who is our assistant uh, director of that unit. Um, NILAG uses the power of law to help New Yorkers in co um, combat social and economic injustice. Um, we address emerging and urgent legal needs with comprehensive free civil legal services, impact lit litigation, policy advocacy, and community education. We help a variety of different communities, in including immigrants, veterans, seniors, families facing foreclosure, children in need of special education, domestic violence victims, LGBTQ communities, among others. Um, NILAG represents over 2,000 New York City resident TPS recipients. We partnered with Councilman uh, Eugene's office to run clinics um, in the wake of the, the earthquake in Haiti and the designation of TPS for that country. Um, we have also um, done clinics then for other uh, TPS communities throughout the years. And we have helped as many people as possible move off of TPS into a more permanent status. So in one particular case, we helped an individual who um, was an HIV positive woman from Haiti, was married to a US citizen, but also had an outstanding removal order. We helped get her case reopened, help her move through many of the legal challenges to actually obtain her green card so she can continue to receive health services and remain with her family. Um, as you can imagine, and as we've discussed here today, there is a variety of services that are needed sort of as we're in this uncertain time period um, for many of these communities figuring out whether TPS will be extended either by a court order or by this administration, if it will be terminated immediately upon de-designation or if it will go through some sort of temporary um, period, which is what has been happening in the past where there's usually a six month period of re-designation or as somebody had mentioned, it's called deferred enforced departure. So that, so that recipients can then be eased off of the status and perhaps find a different status if they're eligible. 
So um, because of all the ongoing litigation, because of all the uncertainty, um, nuanced and timely legal immigration advice is really essential. Um, and I actually think that there are sort of four different buckets um, for legal services that are, are very critical in this time. I think a lot of these have come up in the discussions that you've heard so far. The first is, of course, immigration legal services, providing nuanced and specific consultations for every TPS recipient about their unique situation to see if they have other options and then providing uh, full representation for them to pursue those options. And that is going to encompass not only, um, you know, people on TPS are in such a variety of different circumstances given their long time in the United States and their history here. So that will involve affirmative applications, but also a lot of removal defense. Um, so funding those services adequately, either through existing initiatives or creating new ones. Um, the second bucket is employment discrimination support and other employment related uh, civil legal services. Um, as like we the ones that we just heard. Yes, the ones we just heard. I would also say that there's counseling needed for can people receive unemployment benefits if they are, if their employment is terminated. Um, the answer to that question. The answer is dependent on their situation. Okay. Also, whether people can draw down social security benefits that they've paid into for very many years. So I think there's going to be counseling needed on, on a variety of different employment related um, matters. And that's all legal expertise. I not think like so, yes. just they can go to like the chamber of commerce and get a specialist on, on this is a lawyer that needs to kind right. of walk through. And this okay. is going to be also the intersection of federal, state, and local law to see what people who you know again if they are eligible for continuing employment if there's a gap and then also this discrimination that we had talked about for really advocating for people who may not have a physical card which often is delayed and maybe there's some uncertainty but they have a legal right to work and really making sure that they um, are able to take advantage of that so NILAG does provide some of those services and can do anything from class action lawsuits if there is widespread discrimination to individual like cease and desist letters or information to um, employers to really advocate for those, um, for those rights. And we've done um, some partnerships looking specifically at immigrants and their uh, intersection with employment. So partnering with employment agencies, partnering with, partnering with other um, advocacy groups and unions. Um, the third bucket, um, which we've touched on as well, is legal health support. Um, again, advocating for individuals. This has always been an issue with all immigrant populations, but making sure that they can take advantage of eligibility for Medicaid and navigate some of the legal difficulties of that intersection between eligibility for um, health insurance and immigration status. Um, and I think that that's going to be even more critical for this population in, in particular as they go through the legal limbo and trying to figure out what their status is, either changing status, um, renewing status, or possibly losing status. Um, so making sure, and this is one thing that Action NYC does fund as lawyers in hospitals to do individual consultations and do that advocacy. And I would encourage um, the council to support and maybe fund additional services in that realm. Um, and then finally, um, as some of our, uh, some of the CBOs had mentioned, just wrap around civil services, that this is um, a population that is in need of a lot of legal services and often many of the other legal needs contribute directly to their legal, their immigration case, their employment case, um, and their legal case, their legal health case. And they were very specific in asking for a social worker. Is that, yes. is that your conclusion as well? Yes, Someone I that can kind of pull this whole case together and support them holistically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that that's actually that's a very good way to navigate and have um, have somebody who can advocate in many different arenas mm -hmm. um, and really identify a host of different needs. But then having the the legal services funded to provide those needs. Right, and those gonna, those are going to be two different roles. I believe so. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tracy Lawson. I'm the attorney in charge of the Youth and Communities Project and the Immigration Practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak about temporary protected status. Um, since 2009, BDS has represented over 10,000 clients broadly in our immigration practice, and our Youth and Communities team has represented thousands of Brooklyn residents in their applications for lawful status um, in, and in non-detained removal defense. 
um, we specialize in the most complex cases, um, clients and immigrants who are uh, have a long history of criminal justice involvement, ACS involvement, and um, through the support and funding of the city council, um, we provide legal services to low-income New York um, immigrants and to maintain their status and move towards citizenship. Um, we've established ourselves as a well-known TPS provider, particularly um, with the help of council member Matthew Eugene. We've done some clinics, and just in the last couple of years, we've done hun um, nearly hundreds of, of applications for TPS. Um, I'd like to just highlight a story um, similar to what my counterpart said, the importance of being able to provide um, a full analysis of someone's immigration situation and then to continue to provide uh, full representation in other applications where the person can gain permanent status. Um, so one example of that is um, one of the, a young man who came to the TPS clinic um, was a beneficiary of, or his, his mother was a lawful permanent resident and was petitioning for him. Um, and meanwhile, his TPS status lapsed. Um, unfortunately, his mother passed away during that time. So we were able to help him regain his TPS status and now we're able to help him continue with his application for permanent residency. Um, so one concern that we have is that there's been widespread anxiety and misinformation around the end of TPS due to the Trump administration's decisions. Um, we've had clients tell us that they've heard rumors that literally the day TPS ends, ICE is gonna go into the communities and do massive roundups and deportations. Um, we've had clients talk to us about their considerations of fleeing to other countries because they can't return to their home country, but they, this option is no longer available. Um, and then of course there's just the, a struggle looking forward to preserve their family units and to continue to support their families as they make long-term plans around the end of TPS. So um, we have recommendations that we'd like the council um, to support. One, of course, is to continue funding and supporting or legal services organizations um, to provide direct legal services. Um, the second is to expand the filing fees fund for those other applications where there is another possibility for permanent residency or another status. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about the city, the, uh, sorry, the filing fees fund? Yes. Is that a, is that a, a is that a private fund? Is that a city fund? Oh, uh, my understanding is that the council has um, naturalization funds for citizenship um, applications, so expanding those filing, the filing fees fund to other kinds of applications. Oh, beyond citizenship. Beyond got it. citizenship. So it's not a TPS right. filing. You're saying, got it, now I understand. For TPS, recipients who are eligible for other kinds of relief, a lot of times a barrier to them accessing yeah, the, the those, filing fee. that relief is the exorbitant filing fees. They might be in the 150 to 350% of the federal poverty guidelines, so they don't, they're not eligible for fee waivers, but they don't have disposable income, especially yeah. in the amount of those filing fees. Right, and, and on data sets, do you have a sense of data around how many, how many um, applications end at the filing fee and people don't decide to go forward or can't because they can't access funds and and and, and I think that in general uh, I'm hoping that we can get those pieces of data for us to understand what the barriers are and then build programs to alleviate that pressure where dollars are really the only thing that is needed uh, you have the mechanism you have the relationships all we have to do is kind of insert dollars into it to make it work and happen, uh, especially if there are other non-TPS, uh, for example, percentages of, of TPS clients that are on a process for non-TPS benefits. And the city couldn't answer that question earlier. Um, and it makes sense maybe, you, you could, I'm assuming, through just your population and, and who you're connected with. Um, anyway. Yeah, I don't, I don't have num those numbers handy, but I'm sure we can. But that that exists, I'm assuming, in, even in just trends. Yeah. To build programs and initiatives on our side, so that we can get you what you need. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Margaret Garrett, and I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society of New York. Thank you for this opportunity um, to present. 
I'm not going to go too much into the history of Legal Aid Society and our response to the immigrants. It's in our, our handout, and um, we've been around for a while. Oh, actually, let's get to the mic oh, near you. Yeah. Um, but I do want to talk about what our recommendations would be. Uh, as many of the partners have mentioned, we, we worry about how a loss of TPS would affect TPS holders' access to benefits, including health care. Um, one thing would be we would encourage the city to encourage the state to pass legislation. There is a legislation uh, right now that uh, I'm not sure exactly what point it's out, S1809, um, which would amend the New York State Social Services Law to ensure that TPS beneficiaries continue to receive Medicaid benefits if their TPS has lapsed or been, been terminated. So that, that, that's already been introduced in the state legislative yes. body? Okay, great. Thank um, you. And we would also ask the city to target the immigrants who are losing TPS for the mayor's New York, New York City Care Initiative. Uh, those are two recommendations we would have in terms of um, health insurance. Um, is, that, is the NYC Care the thing that the mayor announced re just recently? Yes. How do you all feel about that? I, I haven't gotten briefed on it, by the way, so I, I don't know much about it. But, and I don't know if you want to go on the record <laughs> or if you want to maybe talk <laughs> offline. Um, yeah, I personally don't have enough knowledge to, okay. to talk about it at this point. All right, well, let's get smart about that yeah. <laughs> together. Um, and that's all I'll say. Um, Moya's still in the house, right? I saw Sam walk out. Cool, thank you. I think um, it's been noted. Anyway. Uh, we also worry that TPS holders are at risk of immigration scams, especially at this moment where there's so many unknown things. It makes them even more... Um, you know, susceptible to notarios and other kinds of immigration fraud, which, as you know, run rampant in our city. Uh, we would urge the city to invest in public service announcements, encouraging TPS registrants to seek legal assistance through Action NYC, um, uh, to try and combat some of the, the people who prey on, on this kind of population. Uh, we also would ask the city to do public service announcements um, advising of the possibility of seeking advanced parole, which is something that many TPS holders are eligible for, and once they come back with a stamp and an inspection, many of them would then be eligible to adjust through a family member. Um, so that's one way to, for TPS holders to get to a permanent status. Just so I can get a better sense of this, essentially you're saying someone that has TPS today travels out of the country and then back with a, with a stamped passport can then begin a process for um, another benefit through a family member who is a, an American citizen. Yes, without getting too much into the weeds, if yeah. um, a person who has TPS but doesn't have a legal entry, so they entered without inspection, even if they're married to a U.S. citizen, they are not eligible to adjust. But there is a possibility for them to get advanced parole uh, for certain circumstances, which gives them permission to leave the country. Then they have the stamp, and now they can adjust to their U.S. citizen spouse. Um, so that's something that uh, we screen for, and I have represented plenty of clients in that, that exact position. Um, and, and finally, if the injunction is lifted, we would ask the city to consider shifting legal service providers deliverables under the Immigration Opportunities Initiative grants from tier two removal cases to more brief service in tier one cases, um, which will give providers time to focus on the particular needs of, of TPS holders. Um, and in terms of also just the, the screening of TPS you know, clients, I, I can speak Personally, I have been to TPS clinics and have seen young people who were eligible, for example, for special immigrant juvenile status, and then they missed the boat because no one had caught it, uh, which is always really hard to see because that's a missed opportunity. And, you know, with more funding for those kind of services, for legal services, we're able to provide those uh, types of services as well. So we're trying to understand exactly what that means. Um, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, I want to be. Um, but so essentially what, we're, what you're saying is that the, the way that the contracts are 
constructed for the city. It doesn't allow you to capture more people in the screenings. And so the screenings can, can be open to more people. Well, no, if, for example, I screened somebody and thought that they were eligible for special immigrant juvenile status, we don't necessarily have the capacity to take that case. And that capacity is based on capacity or capacity based on definition of the type of, of legal assistance you can give to a client? Correct, the latter. The latter. It has to do with the funding. Got it. So they're not going to reimburse you if you go down SIDGE route because that's not the contract. The contract says to do X. Right. Or um, even, you know, brief services under the contract is, is not necessarily representing somebody in an, an immigration proceeding but giving them information or writing an advocacy letter or something to that effect as well. I, I mean, this is another kind of classic case of universal representation. Mm -hmm. Yet again, everyone should have a lawyer no matter what. And if the city is, is restricting your ability to serve uh, a New Yorker, then we're not at universal representation and we're not at Sanctuary City. And so this is just another hint at some other work that I think we can do to prep ourselves for the budget hearings and really think about that access point. And that happens there and that's a contract issue. That's not, the fed it's not Trump saying you can't do that. Right. It's us saying we can't do that. And that's unacceptable. Note. <laughs> uh, and th that's that's important. So thank you for that. And I, I want to come back and kind of get a sense, a better sense about what needs to happen. Um, clearly, well, actually, no, not clearly. No, I, I don't want to restrict us. Everyone should get a lawyer. And especially if we can, we can build out the system with social workers, with interpreters, with and have a robust system. We can we can make sure that everybody maintains trust with us because we're going to be able to deliver. Uh, at a point where we might get TPS and other things removed from um, possibility, including healthcare as well, which we'll come back to later offline. <laughs> Thank you for that. Any other any other points or things that kind of came up on the legal side? Well, maybe to that point, just flexibility in what we do because of the changing landscape in general. With what, so it's hard for us to know: do we need more um, to shift more towards removal defense or more uh, affirmative applications, and and just having that flexibility to kind of provide the needs where they're at, especially since contracts are for a year, or two years, or three years at a time, and things are changing so quickly right now in this field. Yeah, and that's gonna that that's gonna require a better sense of um, defining what that flexibility is. I think the administration is always, well, the Office of Management and Budget is always gonna be uncomfortable with saying, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give all these legal service providers anything that they want, so they can do whenever whatever they want," and and really build it out of values. And I think that due process for all, uh, um, universal representation, I think, is the value that we need to get to. Because uh, right now we're, we're, we're kind of just inching towards these pieces and, and I think it's changing. I think the flexibility is there, but uh, the, if we're not a universal, if we're not agreeing on universal representation, we're going to be, we're going to be chipping away for a long time. And what we want is full access to everything uh, and start at the end. Uh, so flexibility, I hear you big time, but we need to kind of do leapfrog into universal representation. And that's something that I think the state needs to consider now, that we have um, new leadership and, and then prepare for the federal government to be forced to do that at that level as well and make that a constitutional uh, right fulfilled. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our final panel, I believe, is um, Adi, Adi Carr. Uh, both members uh, from Adi Carr uh, Parthana, uh, Gurung, and Narbada, uh, Chetri. Did I say that right? <laughs> Close. Close, okay. <laughs> Please introduce yourselves, and you'll be closing up our, our public hearing on TPS today. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having us and taking concern for TPS. So my name is Narbada Chetri. I'm from Adhikar. Adhikar is the only women-led worker and community center serving and organizing the Nepali-speaking community on 
worker rights, immigration rights, and access to health care. As the only organization working to protect and advocate for Nepali TPS holders, we are here for the nearly 50, 15,000 Nepali TPS holders in the country, a large number of them in New York State, 53,000 TPS holders from all countries are in New York alone and in the city. As one of the 13 countries with TPS and our DED, our members with temporary protected status are in a perilous situation as their status will run out on June 24 of this year, not even six months away. If TPS runs out for Nepalese on June 24 without any legislative or litigative solution, we anticipate major blows to our community. Their status is tied to things like a work permit, health insurance, business, home, car, ownership, and basic protection that undocumented members of our society are unable to access. Because they have a work permit, TPS holders have been able to work legally, however, because it is based on a temporary status. There are risks as the deadline comes closer. Members have reported that they have been discriminated against, not able to find good jobs, or even have been threatened by employers, that they will lose their job. Moreover, they are unable to take advantage of the city's workforce development programs. These programs are built for long-term candidates and are looking for someone to join as a permanent hire. Therefore, individuals with TPS are less likely to be hired. We ask, the, we ask that the city provide a type of city given specific work permit to ensure that even if they lose their federally given work permits, they may still be able to contribute to this economy and support their families by continuing to work. Employers must also be held accountable. There should be a education done for employers, especially those in industries with many TPS holders, so that they understand what their responsibilities are. Oftentimes, the burden is on workers to assert their rights. However, if employers do not know or are not adequately trained on how to engage their workers, the discrimination and unfair treatment will continue. Our domestic worker members are even more vulnerable working in unique conditions in private homes of employers that are not traditionally reached out in employers' engagement. The city should also build stronger enforcement on workforce harassment due to immigration status and allow for more integrity collaboration, especially among agencies working with workers to work with employers and business as well, members like Gita, who have worked for nearly 20 years in a nail saloon, are now facing difficulties in figuring out how to manage their work condition without status. So uh, Prathana, also Adhikar, I uh, just want to say at the same time, we urge the city to look into ways to support small businesses, especially women and minority-led businesses. At this time, several members have reached out to us um, who are TPS holders um, and who were able to start small businesses because of TPS, but now are in a difficult situation where they're forced to decide whether or not they have to sell their business um, or are also susceptible to types of business fraud. Um, and they're in just very desperate situations looking to find some way out while still maintaining their livelihood. Um, we also recognize that our members, while still with some type of status, are feel for, fearful for what will happen once they lose it. Um, New York City claims to be a sanctuary city, and we know that our communities continue to be at risk by detained 
by ICE and local police contain, continue to collaborate with immigration enforcement. Our communities deserve an accessible 24-7 support network that is an alternative to calling and 911, one that's financed and supported by the city in partnership with community groups. Our work with legal organizations will continue, but as casework increases, even as groups like Legal Aid and Urban Justice Center are also reaching an impasse and are unable to take cases. While we utilize city resources like Action NYC, there's little to no feedback or follow up with individuals who call an Action NYC and an automatic hotline is very difficult to access for our members, many of whom uh, English is a second language and some of whom uh, are limited literacy, so they don't even know how to read or write in their own language. Um, if resources like Action NYC could have legal service contacts or point people or a team just for TPS, that would greatly support our legal needs. Um, in addition to all these needs, we stand by and urge you to support the existing campaigns that groups like New York Immigration Coalition are working on as state solutions, I know outside the scope of city, but as New York City, there are opportunities to continue pushing for things like the Green Light Campaign to provide state IDs for all and coverage for all, um, expanding healthcare access for all. And we also urge the city to support community legislative solutions through increased outreach, intentional support, and financial resources. Um, lastly, I know this, this is, again, outside of the city capacity, but we urge the city to do what they can to pressure U.S. congressional representatives across the city to sign on to a legislative solution or a bill um, to provide permanent residency for DREAMers and also TPS holders. Um, this is, again, just a short list of needs that are arising. A lot of organizations that have been here and have testified have spoken to a lot of the pieces that we want also wanted to bring up. I just want to uh, reiterate all of that, so thank you. And thank you for, for staying and making your voices heard. Uh, your organization is an incredible organization. We partner up with all of you all the time to ensure that your, your organizing meets uh, our, our kind of work here at the City Council to, for policy making, laws, and budget as well. And you have some really good ideas about how to create infrastructure to connect communities with language competency. Uh, and, and so I like some of your ideas. In fact, is it possible we can get your, co I already wrote on this one copy that we have, um, we can get your clean copy if you haven't written on it. Um, I, we've written on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But we can send you. Okay, please, make sure that you, you, you send it back to us. Um, and you really kind of know a lot of the work that's happen happening already at the state level and that's where we just need to organize at the city level to ensure that our voices as your representatives are at the negotiating tables for the state as well. Uh, and so it's just great that we're here hearing the same story uh, and the same strategy over and over again. The one thing I wanted to just address uh, is the question around the city providing a type of city given specific work per permit. Uh, I, I don't believe we have, I'm almost sure we don't have the power to do that at the city level because this is a federal, this is a federal issue. Is there any other, is there, is there guidance or kind of legal framework around this? Uh, or is this, is this just an idea about how really if you're get, if, in, if someone loses TPS, they're gonna be losing their livelihood, so we need to find a solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, work permit. yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think one of the things, uh, you know, if there is a workaround, I don't know, but I, I think one of the examples that we've seen that we um, have seen some type of workforce support regardless of documentation has been on a state level with a nail salon workers bill of rights, where nail salon workers were given um, access to be able to get a license, which mm -hmm. is required to work regardless of social security number, right? right. So they can access a license which gives them some type of a thing that you can show an employer. Right. Um, you know, we know that whether or not that they have a work permit, they're still going to work. Employers will still hire them, mm -hmm. they'll pay cash and whatnot, but at least uh, some type of workforce license gave them the ability to be able to negotiate for themselves and, and not be discriminated against. Um, and so that was, I mean, just kind of off the top of my head, that's an example that we've seen at, on a state level, they've been able to kind of create a wrap, like a workaround in some ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And, and I think one, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll offer that has been a growing opportunity for immigrants of multiple communities and access or statuses uh, is our worker cooperatives, uh, businesses, businesses that have been able to, uh, to bring in people. I'll just leave it at that. 
and just say, let's work together, figure out how you can plug in. Uh, and maybe you're already plugged into worker cooperatives, cooperatives and that, that growing phenomenon, and, and we're putting a lot of funding. Uh, I'm, I'm a proud kind of champion for that in, inside the city council, and it's the district that I represent in, in Sunset Park is one of those places where it's kind of embedded into the culture of our communities uh, for, for um, mothers, women, who have kind of taken on that that leadership for themselves and in, in owning businesses, and so let's let's let you're right. Let's talk about worker, um, uh, not rights, but economic empowerment for our immigrant communities, and make sure that everyone has as many opportunities as possible with different models, uh, so that they can they can um, make. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna make money uh, so they can be empowered economically and that's that's what we want okay thank you so much for that and I want to thank everyone for being here today and for uh, really allowing us to ask the questions to the city's to the administration um, and preparing ourselves for the budget hearings which are on their way and I think we we wanted to really ask this question because we know that there are gaps we know that we're following ca uh, cases uh, court cases that could change everything, but we want to be prepared. And I couldn't thank you um, enough for being here today. And I think Moya is here as well, so thank you for staying to the end. And uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>